دكتور اسامة بهيلير السلام عليكم لو خلي نعمل لك نحطك كوهوس مش تقدر تعمل اميوت لحظة هاي دكتور اسامة بهيلير السلام عليكم معانا دكتور اسامه القصبي كذلك السلام عليكم اسامه So, Dr. Mansour, I'd, um, uh, I'd uh, mm. uh, لو سمحت, uh, when it's time for me to wrap it up, just tell me, عشان, um, we can, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, have it on two parts. Hello. Uh, in في خمس, uh, في five minutes. Let me just make sure Ma'ana Dr. Fathi or Dr. Isam. Dr. Fathi, you will end the call. Let me give you a... We will say to the audience, we are with us on the EP today. So if you have a cardiology, when you get to the peak, go to the EP. Let us see here, make a co-host. Dr. Fathi, assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi 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 wa عصام نستنى دكتور عصام يلا تو اوكي اوكي ام سي ميوتد هير ان شاء الله انا موجوده مرحبا دكتور مرحبا مرحبا ناديه بارك الله فيك ام ميوتد اند ليسننج او اي اي ام فيري فلاترد زي ما حكيت ان حضرتك يو ديد اول ذا هيفي ليفتنج فور مي فايتس فيري ايزي فور مي سو كايند اوف يو ناديه جزاك الله كل خير بارك الله فيك Okay, I'll just wait and see when we can start.
ان شاء الله نبدو في ممكن خلال ثلاث دقائق وبالنسبه للاودينس اللي عنده سؤال او استفسار او اي نقطه معينه تقدر تكتب في الشات بوكس تكتب لنا سؤالك وانا ان شاء الله نطرحه على الاكسبرت بانل ودكتور ناديه واثناء الليك جيز دكتور ناديه مرات تسالكم خيارات اوبشنز uh, مثلا A B C you can vote in the chat box write your uh, your answer خليني نشوفه آه. آه، انت باسم عصام يلا خلاص نضيفك انا كاكو هوست ليت مي سي خلاص دكتور عصام يلا مع السلامه معنا دكتور عصام دكتور عصام السلام عليكم تسمع فينا واضح السلام عليكم ورحمه الله خلاص تمام معنا معنا دكتور عصام الله وبركاته عندنا دكتور عصام دكتور فتحي دكتور ناديه وعندنا حضور عرض لا باس به اليوم عرض صراحه اي بلس او سي جاست بيفور وي ستارت فخليني شوف هذه نبي حد لو في امكانيه يعمل ريكوردنج للسيشن جاست ان كيس تو تو بي ويز مي از ا باك اب ريكوردنج تو ذا سيشن ات ويل بي جريت اند خليني نبدا ريكوردنج فروم ماي سايد ات ليست اعتقد عندنا عدد كافي ونتوكل على الله ونبدو باذن الله السلام عليكم ورحمه الله تعالى وبركاته this is our second session of the libyan cardiac society AKG lecture series and we are happy to have dr nadia sunni consultant electrophysiologist in united kingdom to be our speaker today on the expert panel, we have Dr. Fatih Idris, interventional cardiologist and electrophysiologist from US, Nashville, Tennessee, and Dr. Isam Baryun uh, from West Virginia, cardiac electrophysiologist, USA. So without any further ado, Dr. Nadi, the stage is yours. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, awalan, habayt ashkurkum. Ashkur Dr. Mansour ala itahat al-fursa and the Libyan Cardiac Society for uh, inviting me. Bardu uh, ashkur Dr. Fethi with Dr. Aysam for, for agreeing to participate uh, during this session. Um, I have no disclosures and I wanted to start off uh, by saying uh, most of the work in explaining um, the timing and the description for the ECGs or the EKGs were done in the previous session by uh, Dr. Fethi. Uh, also, the Libyan Cardiac Society has run uh, a lot of uh, sessions related to uh, arrhythmia interpretation uh, like that uh, by Dr. Uh, Naila Mansouri and uh, a few sessions with cardiac pacemakers by Dr. Raisam and myself. So there's ample uh, material to review, and I don't want to repeat what was done in the previous sessions, but I want to draw on the information that was given on the previous sessions and highlight a few points in this session in order to review the fundamental ECG diagnostic concepts that we face in our day-to-day -day practice and what makes the ECG such a valuable diagnostic tool. 
Um, I want to solidify our framework for ECG interpretation, and I hope you enjoy the session and get something rewarding out of it. I know that we have a mixture of an audience uh, at different levels of training and uh, with different practice, and I hope someone can um, achieve uh, their goal of attending. So the, the cases are um, allocated at different levels. And I want to prove that EP is nothing like watching paint dry. And that's what our interventional colleagues uh, seem to think we do, that we just watch electrograms go by. Um, far from it, we start our practice with the simple basic 12 lead ECG. And I just want to get a, a feel for the room. So please have a look at this ECG. It's a rapid fire ECG, so um, there's no kind of clinical uh, description attached to it other than this, this ECG is from a 73 year old man who is a smoker who has chest pain. He has a background history of hypertension. Um, he's been on medical treatment for a couple of years and he has no hemodynamic compromise. And you were sent this ECG to report on. So please take about 10 seconds, have a look at the ECG. It's a 12 lead ECG. The patient is in sinus rhythm. And the question here is, does this meet criteria to diagnose a STEMI? So it's either one for yes or two for no based on the information you have. Do you have a diagnostic ECG criteria to say that this is an ST elevation MI uh, ongoing? Okay, so we'll give about 10 seconds because these are rapid firing ECGs just to highlight some points that are important. You can type your answer in the chat box. So you can just type your answer in the chat box. One for yes, nobody knows um, who you are or what you're typing. It's, it's really something that I want you to have a look at. And between you and yourself, do you think that this is enough to activate the STEMI protocol, whether you thrombolize or send to the primary uh, PCI uh, pathway for the cath lab or, or whether not? So have we had any answers or should I we just- have, We have uh, five, five people said, six people said yes and three people said no. Okay, so, and, and this is very, uh, this is a very important um, uh, part of the, 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 the talk that we will come back to the CCG. So I'm just getting a feel for the room, okay? This is another ECG, um, rapid fire. 30-year-old lady with recurrent intermittent palpitations. And you've been sent this ECG as a referral or someone handed it to you and said, please have a look. This is 30-year-old lady with recurrent intermittent palpitations. And yes, there is a trail for diagnostics, but just looking at the ECG, is there anything in the ECG that, that triggers your interest or, or makes you think uh, for one, uh, towards one diagnostic route, one uh, pathology rather than another, um, rather than going down the standard lines of we'll do a halter and do this and do that. Um, so just another, uh, you know, this is between you and yourself, do you have anything in the ECG that would make you think one way or the other? Um, and uh, just have about 10 seconds look at the ECG. Um, and if anyone has a, a diagnosis that they want to uh, share, please write it in the chat box. Any any answers in the chat box? Uh, someone wrote uh, BVC. Someone wrote ST segment depression in the lateral leads. Others said called ST and AVR. Okay. Remember, so, you have to correlate with arrhythmia. <clears throat> so, so what what I uh, I want to highlight if if you look at the eighth beat. So if we look one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and the ninth beat. So this ECG is showing sinus rhythm. Uh, the P waves are normal. They're going high to low, so they are positive in the inferior leads, 2, 3, and AVF. But if you look at the eighth beat, there is a little bit of discrepancy in the QRS morphology. So we see the PR interval compared to the previous beat is shortened. There is upsloping and slurring of the QRS, indicating there's a delta wave there. What about the next beat? We see that here as well. It's a, almost a fused beat. So that will 
make one wonder whether there's intermittent pre-excitation, i.e. intermittent WPW, and you've got a young lady who complains of intermittent palpitations. So it's very important that you look at every single beat on the ECG. GP has sent you this ECG and he wants you to report it because this is from a 40 year old man with health anxiety applying for life insurance, okay? So regardless of, of, of the whole context, you have this ECG in front of you and you want to report on it. Is there any pathology in this ECG? If there is, what is the pathology in the ECG? So also I'm going to give you, the, these are just um, uh, screening uh, ECGs. So I'm just going to give you a, a few seconds to have a look at that. These are the limb leads, the frontal leads. And this here is the uh, precordial leads or the chest leads. And the question is, do you think their sinus bradycardia is one? Do you think there's long QT, it's two? Do you think there it's a normal ECG, that's three? Do you think that the, you need more info and that's four? So you're not gonna write uh, the report for the, 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 the life insurance um, submission, you're reporting on the ECG. Okay, so if I go back, I'll go back and show you, this is the frontal plane, the limb leads. And here is the chest leads. And look at the whole ECG. Okay. Any information there in the chat? Yeah, we have some people answered a number one, and others answered a long QT, and someone said the speed is 50. Excellent. Well done. This is an ECG, again, for a 20-year-old who's being screened because they're gonna take up uh, professional uh, sports. So this is a 20-year-old uh, sporting individual who is um, being screened uh, pre-professional uh, athletics. Okay, so you need to report on this ECG. and have a look through its sinus rhythm. It's roughly 75 beats per minute. And these um, are the 12 leads. Okay. So I've put the ECGs now side by side and that's to demonstrate an important concept that it is very important that you look at the standardization of the 12 lead ECG. ECGs are performed by many healthcare workers of different skill mix and different skill set. Um, and as long as you appreciate what it is you're looking at, you can arrive to the right diagnosis. We are accustomed at recording our 12 lead ECG at a sweep speed of 25 millimeters per second and using a voltage of 10 millimeters per millivolt. And if you look at the ECG on the left, you can see here that the voltage is double what we're accustomed to. It's at 20 millimeters per millivolt compared to the ECG on the right, which is the standard ECG at 10 millimeters per millivolt. And that is the ECG I showed you for the 20 year old sports individual. You have to appreciate that if your ECG that you're sent is taken at a measurement that is outside what were used as standards, you would have to accommodate your interpretation by halving the voltage. Now, do we sometimes increase the voltages on ECGs? Yes, we do sometimes when we want to see small signals, we increase the amplitude to see those small signals, but you have to do that knowingly. And that means when someone sends you an ECG and you look at the ECG, you must scrutinize it to ensure that it is a validated ECG. It is important to say that some places, so this is the ECG that I showed you and well done for the person that said it was taken at 50 millimeter speed, absolutely. Because ECGs, although standard 12 lead, we are accustomed that they are taken at 25 millimeters per second. 
Um, there are some countries, especially if you're working in Northern Europe in the Scandinavian countries, some countries will take their ECGs at 50 millimeters per second. Some people will record it at 50 millimeters per second and not realize that that's the way their machine is set. And you have to take that into consideration because if you look here at 50 millimeters per second, you think that this is bradycardia with a heart rate of 30 seven or 38, but is actually uh, heart rate is around 75. Okay, and these were exactly the same ECGs taken at different sweep speeds and taken at different voltage timings. So that's important to appreciate. There is no long QT, there is no LVH, there is no bradycardia, it's a normal ECG. Okay. So those, that's the first thing that you need to appreciate when you're taking a 12 lead ECG, is it valid? So going back to our first case about would you activate the STEMI pathway, the ECG that we showed is looking at a voltage amplitude double the normal 20 millimeters per millivolt. And therefore what you see as ST elevation V2 is actually not ST elevation. And when we ask them to repeat the ECG at the standardized 25 millimeter per second for 10 millimeters per millivolt, this is what we get. And I'm sure you can appreciate that this is not an ST elevation infarct, but rather a uh, sinus rhythm with a degree of left axis deviation, and it is not an ongoing MI. So I hope that just sheds light at how important it is to obtain standard information because all what you uh, use in your diagnostics, the duration of the P wave, the duration of the QRS, the QT interval, that is based on the 25 millimeter per second, 10 millimeter per millivolt amplitude and sweep speed. Do we see ECGs that are faster than 25 millimeter per second? Yes, absolutely. An EP, every day we look at ECGs and I will show you some examples that are running at 100 millimeter per second or 200 millimeter per second to slow them out. And we can see small signals and use that for timing and calibration. And I will show you some examples. So, Moving on to this case. This case has clinical implications. We have 65 year old female in the emergency department. She's known to have hypertension on treatment. She comes with chest pain and palpitations and cardiology are paged urgently to come to the ED. And the question here is, do we give dual antiplatelet therapy? Number two, do we activate the STEMI primary PCI pathway? Number three, do we give heparin or low molecular weight heparin? Number four, all of the above. Number five, none of the above. And I want the best kind of uh, probable answer by looking at this ECG. So you have a 65-year-old lady who's known to have hypertension, treated chronically for hypertension, presents to your ED with chest pain and palpitations. And this is the ECG. And you are paged urgently as the cardiology resident or cardiology fellow. You're per paged urgently to come to the ED department. And please vote. So one, dual antiplatelet. Two, activate STEMI, primary PCI pathway. Mm -hmm. Three, heparin, low molecular weight heparin, be that clexane, uh, mm -hmm. tenzapyrin, deltapyrin. Four, all of the above five, none of the above. And in order for you to get to what you're gonna do, you have to have achieved a diagnosis from the ECG. So please have a look and, um, and, and, and vote. And it's again, it's your own learning. It's between you and yourself. Nobody knows what you're voting, um, but these are uh, intended to highlight some important concepts, which at times we tend to ignore. So anybody voting in the chat? We have 10 people voted already and the majority voted for number two. Number two, activate STEMI pathway. Okay, so, so this ECG, uh, you are not alone in thinking that. So the, the, the cardiologist was paged urgently to the emergency department because the emergency staff thought that this was an inferior infarct. Okay, now, I want you to appreciate some things. 
This is the ECG, how it should have looked. Okay, so I'm gonna go back. So my answer is number three, heparin and low molecular weight heparin, okay? Right, because anticoagulation is definitely warranted here because this ECG shows atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response. There is a degree of probably rate-related ischemia with ST changes, um, could be a reflection of hypertensive heart disease, could be uh, a non-STEMI. That is not the question. The question here, is this a STEMI? If you look at this ECG, you can appreciate that AVR is strongly positive. You can appreciate that the inferior leads are very negative with Q waves and there is ST elevation in the inferior leads. But when do we get an AVR that is strongly positive? There are only three, maybe four conditions that we get a strongly positive AVR. Um, and um, uh, th those conditions are what? One, we have VT, so the impulse is coming from the ventricles going up to the atrium. Well, this is not VT. Two, we have severe left main stem disease. Three, we have Wolf Parkinson White. Four, um, dextrocardia. Um, and so if we have a look that there, something has to trigger you to think that is this ECG Probable. Is this VT? It's not VT. The QRSs are narrow. So is this a true inferior infarct? So what I can tell you is that there is switching of the leads. The leads, augmented leads AVR and AVF, if you look there, are switched with lead two and lead three. And I'm putting them side by side for you to compare. So this is not an inferior STEMI. And I hope I have demonstrated that to you right now. So side by side, you can see AVR, how it should look on the left-hand side versus how it looks on the original ECG that we were fast bleeped for. And if you are not looking carefully at your ECGs, using the information that you learned that the ECG um, part of it, looking at the rate and the rhythm, but also looking at the QRS access, this access on the right, is an indeterminate access, very northwestern access. This is unlikely with this type of rhythm. So you need to put two and two together to be able to come to a diagnosis. What we have is yes, the patient has atrial fibrillation. So I hope that clarifies things. And to, to, to piggy bank uh, uh, off of that, I've put an ECG here. So this one was a, techni uh, a technical type of dextrocardia related to the fact that there was switching of the leads. This one is an ECG that shows sinus rhythm. If you look at the inferior leads, can you see my mouse here moving? Yes, we do see it well. So if you look at the inferior leads 2, 3, and AVF, we see that the P wave is upright and positive in 2, 3, and AVF. So it's going from the sinus node high to low. And then we see in V1, this is an adult patient, not a juvenile pediatric patient. We have a very prominent R wave in V1. And if you're looking at the ECG and you're the cardiology resident, alarm bells need to start ringing. You have a very prominent R wave in V1. There are about nine cases where you have a prominent R wave in V1. And maybe the expert panel will help me out here, but R wave in V1, you need to think about well, where is this R wave going? So V1 to V6. So if you have a very big R wave in V1 and a very big S wave in V6, that means you're moving away from V6. The impulse, the impulse or the electricity, if it moves away from a lead, it gives a negative deflection like an S wave. If it moves toward the lead, it gives a positive deflection like an R wave. So here you're moving towards V1, but you're moving away from V6. Where is V6? At the apex, you're moving away from V6. So the only way that this can be true is you have something like this. And what's that? That's dextrocardia. And why is that the case? Because if we look at how a normal ECG should look, we have P waves that are positive in two, three, and AVF, so they're going from high to low. 
we have an R wave in V1 that's very small and it grows as we pass from V1 to V6. So as we're going from the right sternal edge towards the apex, the R wave grows and your QRS access is normal. And this shows you here how the ECG is used, the stickers that we put on the patients, how they are used anatomically to be able to make you think what's happening. So this is our frontal plane axis, heart in the center, nice small heart here. And this, front, uh, this frontal plane axis shows you what the limb leads, one, two, and three, and what the augmented leads are measuring, where, where they're measuring. And the precordial plane axis here is V1, two, three, four, five, six at the apex, and how the impulse is going here to lead uh, towards lead one, which is going from right to left. So negative polarity, example S waves, means that the electrical impulse is moving away from the recording electrode and positive polarity, which means it's above the isoelectric line. The R wave means the impulse moves towards the recording electrode. And remember, when you have a situation where you don't know why you have such a big um, R wave in V1, and a small um, R wave in V6, but a huge S wave in V6, you can always put electrodes on the right side and do right-sided leads. There's nothing to prevent you from doing that. Put a mirror image of the electrodes on the right side to right-sided leads. You can do posterior leads. The leads will show you what the impulse is in relation to the heart, in relation to where you put them. OK, so I hope that illustrates things. I'm very happy to bring in my colleagues. If they want to comment on this, uh, please uh, do. And if anyone has any questions. Yeah, uh, briefly, I will mention something to Nadia. I remember when I started as a cardiologist in my first few months, they are using different AKG machine and the whole staff, they have like already standard machine. And honestly, I made the mistake. I'm learning from your lecture today. So I was diagnosing a lot of people. I had interest in cardiac amyloid heart disease, and I see a lot of low voltage. I said, you know what? It's different than my fellowship. Everyone has low voltage here. What's happening? It took me maybe two months to figure out other cardiologists, they come and go. They don't pay attention to the voltage until I said, where is the setting of the machine? And just as the only thing I would say, pay attention to the numbers on the AKG. Mon conductor or doctor. So these pits, uh, points and pitfalls is a little reminder for you to have a look at um, in your own time. So um, I'm going to move on to this case. And now we're starting in the heavy stuff. OK, so here we've now established that we're going to use the setting of 25 millimeters per second. We're going to use our voltage or amplitude setting of 10 millimeters per millivolt. So we've got our standardized ECG, and I'm happy to say that this is standardized. And this is a 67-year-old man who has poorly controlled hypertension. He has a good ventricle, um, and he comes with this ECG. He has some symptoms, a little bit of breathlessness. You know, he, he has some symptoms, a bit of breathlessness, a bit of tiredness. So this is his ECG. And I, I want people to look at the ECG and please comment on what you see. So um, do we see any anything? So we had an answer Anyone? for left bundle branch block, right bundle branch block, second answer. A okay. brief citation. Left bundle with WBW, left bundle, WBW pseudo infarction. Okay. Okay. So, so um, it, it's good for us to talk about this ECG. So we have the rhythm is sinus. So first of all, when when we, uh, I, I don't want to um, insult anybody's intelligence. I'm doing this to remind myself first before anyone else. So when we look at an ECG. Here, for the purpose of this presentation, the ECG is anonymized, so you don't um, uh, get anyone's information and aren't able to identify the patients. But in your practice, 
Number one, and I will tell you from personal experience, make sure that you are looking at the ECG that belongs to the patient that you think you are looking at. Because people can hand you multiple ECGs and it might have the wrong patient's name on it, or it might belong to another patient. Um, so first look at the name, look at the date the ECG was taken and look at the, the, the data on it to make sure that this is your patient. Second, we've already identified that this ECG is valid and we know what speed speed and what voltage. Third, we're gonna look at the activation, meaning um, the rhythm, is it sinus or is there an arrhythmia? Is there a tachyarrhythmia? Is there a bradyarrhythmia? And we're gonna look then at what the P wave does with the QRS and is the QRS normal or abnormal? And we're gonna try to tie it all together to make a diagnosis. So if we were looking, we'll say this is sinus rhythm because we see P waves, okay? We see P waves and the P waves are positive in the inferior lead. So they're coming high to low. So they're coming from the SA node downwards. But then we see a P wave here and a P wave here. So we have this P wave seems to be conducted and this P wave is not. So there is two to one. Already from the outskirts, we have two to one. And we can see that in our rhythm strip below, this P wave is conducted to this QRS, this P wave has no QRS. This P wave is conducted to this QRS, this P wave has no QRS, and we see the rhythm is bradycardiac, okay? So we can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven big squares. So it is bradycardiac. We know that the heart rate is uh, below 40 beats a minute, so it's around 37 or 35 beats a minute, okay? So that's one. Second, the QRS is very abnormal. It's very broad. It's absolutely more than the 120 milliseconds or the three small squares that we look at. And in, in addition to being broad, it's very slow upstroke uh, with slurring in the initial leads and, um, and it's giving us a delta. So it is pre-excited. So we have two to one AV block with pre-excitation. So there is a delta wave. So this person has two to one AV block and a delta wave. The, it's very positive in V1. So it's giving us a right bundle-like morphology. It is not right bundle branch block. It is pre-excited with very, very positive in V1 and positive all throughout the precordial leads. So this means the accessory pathway is somewhere very, very lateral and anterior on the uh, mitral valve annulus. That's not the scope of this talk, but that's just a hint there. So what should we do? Should we ablate this accessory pathway? So if you think we should ablate this accessory pathway, please put yes. And if we think we should not ablate it, put no. So we have uh, pre-excitation, delta wave, WPW, with two to one AV block. So should we uh, ablate this accessory pathway or, or not? It's an absolute no that we should not ablate it. So, so far we have three no, no, and two yes. Okay, so those who said no, why did you say no? Someone said because of AV block. Okay, that's, that's right. So if, if we have a look, so first of all, we know that there's two to one AV block. We don't know the level of block. We're not gonna get very much into the level of block, but what we're gonna do is just see here. So what happens if I blocked the AV node? What happens if I block the AV node? What would happen? What do you think? So the accessory pathway or the delta wave, the delta wave is, is a fusion between the impulse going down the normal conduction system, going down the normal hiss per Kinji system, along with the fusion going down the accessory pathway. And how fast it gets to the accessory pathway depends on how fast it can transmit into the atria and where the accessory pathway is. Um, and what happens in the AV node depends on what the hiss per Kinji system is doing. So if I block the AV node, so here, I blocked the AV node. How do you think I blocked the AV node here? So if I block the AV node, so we know of things that we can give the patients provocation tests that we can give the patients that short, short, very short acting like adenosine. So if I blocked the AV node with adenosine and I gave an injection of adenosine, so here I blocked the AV node, but what happened? What happened? We start to see that there is every P wave is followed by a QRS, P followed by a QRS, P followed by a QRS. So that two to one 
went to one to one. But what all of the impulses are going down the accessory pathway. And if we look at the accessory pathway or the delta wave, it's actually broader. All of the impulses are going down the accessory pathway. So the AV node is blocked. So if I ablate the accessory pathway and the AV node is diseased, what happens to the patient? So then I've blocked the only way that the impulse can be transmitted. The AV node has disease, so the patient will end up with severe bradycardia and symptoms of heart block. Okay, so this is a pathway that we don't want to really ablate. Um, and I uh, would uh, value uh, the participation of my colleagues. So this is just a little schematic to show you sinus node fires. It gives an impulse. It goes down the AV node. There is an accessory pathway in this patient. Some of the impulse goes down the accessory pathway. The accessory pathway is way on the left on the free wall antralat on the mitral valve annulus. But if I block the, excess, uh, the AV node with adenosine, all of the impulse then will go down the accessory pathway. So if I ablate that, that's a bit of a problem. And I'd welcome any comments. No comments? Yeah, one thing I'd like to add, this is an excellent presentation of your combining AV conduction disease to the presence of accessory pathway. I would like to just add that even if the AV conduction was one-to-one, -one, we still don't ablate accessory pathway just because it's there. If it's an innocent bystander, we don't do ablation. We have to prove that it's part of a circuit that's causing the patient symptoms or causing a fib. And, and, and that's a very... Uh, excellent point that Dr. Isam has brought in, that just because an accessory pathway is there, we don't do cosmetic surgery to the ECG to take it away if the pathway is not causing a problem. Thank you very much. That's very important. And I like the cosmetic surgery. <laughs> <laughs> so this is... <laughs> this is um, move, uh, moving on from that one to show you here 35-year-old lady with recurrent fast palpitations. We have no documented tachycardia. But as I told you, I want you to scrutinize every beat. And if we look at the beats here, we see that there's something not quite right. There's a little bit of a delta. Yeah, the PR interval is a bit short. PR interval is a bit short. And it's not a true delta, but it gives you a bit of a hint and you wonder. And because you wonder, instead of doing an EP study, which is an invasive procedure, this lady does have palpitations. We haven't documented the tachycardia. Yes, we can go down the route of monitoring with um, uh, cardiac memos, halters, wearable devices, whatever, to try to catch that arrhythmia. But we have a little hint there is maybe there's something going on and we can easily do an adenosine challenge. And when I've given adenosine 18 milligrams, we see that delta wave come out because what happened? We blocked the AV node. And so the delta wave is now the only other route that the impulse can get to the ventricle. And therefore it manifests, you bring it out. It's a provocation test to bring it out. Um, so it, it really brings it out here. And um, if you, in the, um, the delta wave, the, 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 the pathway could be far away from the AV node. Um, and therefore, geographically, for the impulse to get to it will take longer, or sometimes the patient could have structural heart disease that causes the impulse delay. So by the time it gets to the accessory pathway, you know, it doesn't give you a manifest accessory pathway, even though it can transmit in the forward direction, which is called the antegrade direction. So sometimes you can get a hidden pathway that transmit in the opposite retrograde direction. Uh, you don't see that on an ECG, but just be mindful on an ECG, sometimes you get a hint about the pathway. And here, as I have demonstrated that we can bring it out with provocation with adenosine, um, that is important information in someone who is having repeated tachycardia, who tells you it's like a switch on and a switch off. And there, you can either look for arrhythmia non-invasively, or you could schedule um, with the patients 
involvement and their consent, an EP study to, to determine whether there is inducible tachycardia and what it is and what the mechanism is and get rid of the pathway. So you have enough evidence to go by just looking at these ECGs. And another place where adenosine is very important, and this has been extensively uh, talked about in Dr. Fethi's lecture about two months ago, and also uh, Dr. Naila's uh, lecture uh, on broad complex tachycardias, how you use adenosine as a provocation for diagnostic purposes. So in this uh, trace here, we have a left bundle branch block morphology tachycardia that's roughly about 150 beats a minute. And you wonder whether you're seeing P waves here. Is it P wave? Is it T wave? And it is broad and it's left bundle uh, and it's typical left bundle, but you're not sure, oh, is this an atrial tachycardia? Is it an atrial flutter? Uh, could it be ventricular? So giving adenosine here, we give adenosine and we see you block the AV node and the atrial flutter carries on. So it's carrying on in the atrium. It doesn't care what the AV node is doing. The AV node is blocked. So the ventricular impulse doesn't get to it, but the you can see the flutter cycle length is carrying on. And, and that's uh, a diagnostic use um, of adenosine. So I hope I've demonstrated here the importance of standardization of the ECG, the importance of really scrutinizing every beat in the ECG, the importance of ensuring that you have uh, technically attached your leads appropriately and using provocation to achieve a diagnosis. And now we're going to move on to more clinically relevant stuff that we see with a bit of discussion. So... Dr. Andy, I have one question. Yes. If you can please go back to the good EKG that showed AV block with pre-excitation. Because when I was just looking at it, I mean, why would an AV node block prevent the accessory pathway from conducting? Okay. That was my first question. Um, because if you go back to the next slide where you gave adenosine, yeah, because if adenosine sometimes reduces or causes uh, um, slow, uh, slowing down of the sinus rate, if the sinus, you know, it causes uh, to reduce chronotropy. So if the sinus rate decreased, that's probably explains why the conduction became one to one. I can't measure exactly the P to P, but if the, if the um, adenosine slows down the sinus rate, that can explain why the accessory path is conducting every B. Because if you go to the previous slide, the fact that the AV node did not conduct does not prevent the accessory pathway from conducting. You know, um, that's yes. just my comment I wanted to make. Sometimes sometimes the P to P is shorter when you have a QRS in between them because the carotid sinus gets stimulated. So in even in 2 to 1 AV block, you can see that the P to P interval in the presence of a QRS in between them is always shorter than the P to P without a QRS in between. So ventricular phasic response. Exactly. Yes. So that's yeah. why the second P did not, um, it came probably a little bit earlier than the third P as an interval. And that's why the accessory pathway ERP was okay to conduct when there's no QRS in between. Previous that, that is possible. It could be that the accessory pathway is also very flimsy. I mean, ventricular phasic response is is yes, um, it, but the accessory pathway could also be a flimsy accessory pathway. You know, he's a sixty seven year old man. He's lived with this it, his whole but life. But it conducted on the next time. It conducted here of... when we blocked the AV node. So here, there's no other route for it to conduct. But it, it could conduct if the AV node blocks. With the previous slide, right? Why would they, Meaning, they're not, unless they're not related, yeah. the accessory pathway is not related to the AV node. It can, it's not. It's still allowed to conduct. So I don't think the AV do node has an authority over the accessory pathway to prevent it. So what do you what do you think the mechanism is mm -hmm. here? It's to do with the uh, refractoriness and the relative. I think I think I think what happened. There's two things. It, it's possible that the sinus node slowed down 
because adenosine can decrease, decrease chromatin property number two with the dilatation of the vessels and the patient feels, you know, profusely hot, that could change the autonomic response to the heart and change the effective refractory period altogether of the accessory pathway. Great point. Can I uh, come in here? Please do. Yeah, uh, great uh, point, Isama Nadi. I, I agree. I think if you look at the, I think ventriculophasic is probably the best explanation for that. Go to the previous one. Uh, and, and as you can see, as I some pointed out, I think the PP interval of the conducted P to the other one is shorter than, slightly shorter than the PP to the other one. But this rate here, I think it's still faster than the rate with adenosine was given. So the P to P interval in the next slide, uh, for me at least, when I go to the next slide, I think the PP, P to P interval here is quite shorter. Longer, yes. uh, longer, longer. longer. And yeah, that's, it's, short, it's a slower longer. sinus rate. Right. Exactly, and, and I think that's why they... right. So I think that's explained why you don't conduct when it's slightly faster. Which is, by the way, enough. I think it should explain uh, that this patient should not have that pathway ablated, right? Ablated, it's, it's a exactly. Flimsy, a flimsy pathway. The other, yes. the other, the other very interesting thing in this EKG, if you look at the the third beat from your right to the left, if you go from right to left. Third beat from the top, th third beat, beat one. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You see, there is a, I think there is a retrograde P wave conducted there. And this tells you the pathway is probably robust in the retrograde direction. And so I think that's a, probably a retrograde P wave somehow yeah. conducted. And that reset the sinus node. So this pathway uh, may not be robust for creating a sustained tachycardia of the AV node, is kind of uh, uh, very uh, robust. But it can conduct VA conduction, i.e., if you but ended up putting a pacemaker. I think that's retrograde it. conduction, though. I think. Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah, that's right. No, it's retrograde through the AV node. Oh, through the AV a node. Lot of, a lot of times, I mean, most complete heart blocks I've seen that are complete right. heart block anti-grade conduct retrograde. Right. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's so the 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 AV node it's a very weak anti-gradely, but it's still robust exactly. retrogradely. That's what I meant. In other words, if you put a pacemaker in this patient and uh, if the milieu gets uh, convenient for a pacemaker mediated tachycardia, assuming we didn't apply all the things. So I've seen cases where somebody has a, a full anti-grade block in the AV node and still intact retrograde block, and then you can create a retrograde tachycardia. I thought that's a beautiful beat there. You see it there, the one before the last. So this, this, so this here, for everyone where I'm showing, this is a P wave retrograde. P wave here. Um, and then you have this pause and it resets the sinus node and we start again and then we get um, beautiful, to beautiful case, Nadia. This is a beautiful case. Very nice. Okay. So, so the take home message is not all pathway needs to be ablated, particularly not this pathway. Okay. So, um, right. So um, for the audience, and for anyone looking at this ECG, I think um, I want you to have a look and come up with two, three differential diagnoses, maybe three main ones, three main differential diagnoses for this ECG. Um, and, and I will confess that you will get the order of those diagnoses different depending on who you show the ECG to. So, you know, if you look at the ECG, sinus rhythm, we have some T wave changes with T wave depression, with T wave inversion in the precordial leads. And um, I'll throw it out to my colleagues um, for, uh, uh, for to, to give us some ideas of what we can expect or what we need to look for in, a, in this type of ECG. So, Dr. Aysam or Dr. Fethi, please. Uh, your contribution is is sought and welcome. Yeah, I mean, as an EP, of course, when we see T wave inversions V1 to V3, we start thinking about uh, some rare diseases that we don't often see, which like ARVD or Brugada to differentiate. Um, you know, I mean, clinically, ARVD would be probably earlier age in that. 20s, we're going to manifest a little bit later. If you look structurally, we're going to have a structure art on echo and cat. 
ARVD has RV dysfunction. Um, but on EKG, um, ARVD is more likely to have T wave inversions V1, 2, V3, but Brogata is more like a right bundle of branch block, some ST elevation. And then T wave inversions, you may see it in V1, V1, V2, but really the whole V1, 2, V3, from my experience. Um, ARVD is fibro fatty, you know, deposition. So you have VTAC caused by scar and a Brogata is more a sodium channel abnormality. But looking at this, I don't see any ST elevation. Uh, I really don't see a clear epsilon wave. Um, I just see, I see ST depression actually and T wave inversion. So right. as, an, as an EP, I'm not really worried about Brogata or for some reason, uh, Brogata is more likely to have AV node disease and his bundle disease. But in general, um, I don't think it's one of the two. Right. So, so the, the CCG, as I said, if you show it, you will get an answer de um, in the priority depending on who you show it to. So exactly as Dr. Raisam said, that an EP might think of arrhythmia conditions associated with this type of manifestation where you have slightly a right bundleish type so you have a, a little bit of an r wave in v1 you have t wave inversion in v1 to here v4 um the uh you have t wave inversion in fear lead so if you show it to an interventionist they will tell you that this is probably related to lad disease lad occlusion uh and an anterior instemi um, but also you need to look at the fact that the patient has right axis deviation here. So you have a deep S wave in lead one, a little bit of an R wave in V1. So right ventricular strain, anything that can cause right ventricular strain. So somebody might say to you, oh, this is inferior posterior infarct, or another person may say to you, it's a PE. So your differential diagnosis for this Wellens type ECG with an R wave in V1 with right axis deviation is number uh, and, and T wave inversion in lead three. So you need to think of infraposterior infarcts. You need to think of pulmonary emboli. You need to think of Brigada um, uh, uh, ARVC or type Brigada syndrome and obviously ischemia. So those are the differential diagnoses. And the clinical context of the case is exceptionally important. If the patient came to you with chest pain, if the patient had symptoms of an infarct, if the patient came to you with acute breathlessness, um, so that you have, if the patient came with symptoms of palpitations, you have to put it all together. And we'll move on to show something, showcase something similar. So this is a 73 year old man who was admitted with untriggered sudden fall transient loss of consciousness. He was walking, he stopped at the bus stop and suddenly was on the floor. Passersby came to see how he's doing. He was, an ambulance was called, he was sent to the emergency department. He had suborbital bruise and he had facial injury. His background history, he has a BMI of 32. He was not drunk. He doesn't drink. He had a past medical history of type two diabetes, well controlled on oral anti-hypoglycemic agents. He had uh, over 10 years ago, prostate cancer, which had been cured and he had been discharged from follow-up after having brachiotherapy localized to the prostate. Okay, so this is his ECG. And I want to appreciate, I'm gonna take you through it. I want you to appreciate, we have this kind of little, little Q wave and then R wave. So, and, and here it's it's almost an RSR. So there's a, a right bundle-ish. We don't call it a right bundle, but a right bundle-ish. We have some R wave in V1. The rhythm is irregular. It is atrial fibrillation. The rhythm is slightly tachycardiac. So the average heart rate is roughly about 120 beats a minute. Um, and we have here uh, in, in lead one. So this is one, two, and, and, and three and AVF, AVL. So we have um, a normal axis. We don't really have a right axis. So we have atrial fibrillation, right bundle-ish type uh, of feature and uh, uh, an S wave that we see in lead one uh, and, and, and a PVC. So that's what we have. But we have someone who's come with this abnormal ECG. We have atrial fibrillation. I will share with you some of the blood tests. The D-dimer was almost 26. 
normal is below one. So he had a CT done, non-contrast CT of his head to make sure that there was no stroke or intra, uh, intracranial hemorrhage. And there was no stroke or intracranial hemorrhage. Uh, there was facial trauma at the side of his left eye. Um, but then he went on to have a CT pulmonary angiogram. So CT scan, and it shows it was heavily thrombosed. So the right pulmonary artery, um, we've got here a, a, a cross section and here a coronal section. We see that the right pulmonary artery and its branches are all full of thrombus. Here we see that the left pulmonary artery, uh, the segmental, um, branches have a lot of thrombus. So this is a huge, massive PE that caused him to collapse. He probably collapsed, hyperfused. The, the thrombus moved a little bit, so he regained um, some perfusion. Um, and the question now is, what would you do? So my audience colleagues, would you, number one, thrombolize? Would you, number two, anticoagulate? Would you, number three, I don't know, ask a friend, or neither? So please, um, this is the CTPA. This is the ECG with atrial fibrillation in that right bundleish type of appearance. So what would you do? And I'll give you about five seconds to answer. So do we have any answers, Dr. Mansour? We had uh, two options for number two, one option for number one. And someone asked, uh, what are the hemodynamics? Just to let you know, he came with syncope. So he came with syncope. So by the time he got to the hospital, he had a blood pressure. His blood pressure was uh, at least 120 uh, systolic and he had a heart rate of 120. Um, but he had a syncope to the degree that he fell and hit his face on the ground. So keep that in consideration if someone had a syncope with pulmonary embolism. So for you to get a syncope with pulmonary embolism, just as Dr. Mansour has is alluded to, is that you have cut off your pulmonary circulation. That means you had a massive thrombus there that probably blocked the flow in your pulmonary artery or both segmental branches. And then um, one of them is shifted, you get a, a bit of reperfusion. Okay, so for you to have that severe syncope. I will go on to say that bedside echocardiography for screening showed uh, the pulmonary pressures were in the region of about 55. Uh, and uh, I would say maybe uh, we, if you add another option, mechanical thrombectomy now, do you do it? If there is any concern. <clears throat> so that is a fantastic point, and we'll come back to it. We don't have that option, Dr. Mansour. I think, um, I don't know how it is where you practice. There are only specific centers that have that option. Um, so you're in a life-threatening situation here. So what are you going to do? That's not number five on the, on the uh, questions, you see. You can't put that in. <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, um, so he was given anticoagulant with low molecular weight heparin injections. And, we, uh, and, and, and the concern, we did not thrombolize. We were concerned about the facial injury um, we, uh, and the head injury. So we did not thrombolize. We gave um, low molecular weight heparin and we sta he stabilized on that. Um, and he had low molecular weight heparin for 48 hours. And then we get this ECG. We get headache and we get this ECG. So what's your next step? What's happening? Anyone want to volunteer? Anyone from our expert panel want to volunteer? I want you to appreciate this ECG. Um, it's a little bit different to the ECG that I showed you, the original one with atrial fibrillation. So first of all, we have bradycardia, okay? We have significant bradycardia and we have prolonged QT interval. So as an EP, we always look at that relative even to the bradycardia. 
but we also have marked T wave inversion in V1 to V4. And I want this to trigger alarm bells for you when someone gets a headache. I want you to remember Cushing reflex that we um, learned in medical school when you get raised intracranial pressure. Okay, so um, even uh, us that are not your neurologist, we can appreciate that there is white uh, here on the left side of the brain. So this is acute subdural. It's bleeding, it's acute because it's acutely blood. We've got pressure effect. So the midline is shifted. You see the ventricle is, is, is being uh, pushed. And uh, the clinical correspondence, we have a dilated pupil. Okay, and, and this was not, uh, he was not thrombolized. So going back to uh, Dr. Mansour's point about mechanical thrombectomy, it would have been a, an ideal treatment in this situation had it been available. Okay, any comments, any questions? One small comment, just clinically, even though it's not relevant to the management, um, AFib or flutter can cause DVT, and then it dislodges and causes a PE. So it is still possible that uh, flutter was the initial pathology that occurred, and not um, necessarily secondary to the PE. I take I take on that I take on your point. Um, I think uh, from my personal experience, for AF or flutter to cause a PE of that magnitude, there has to be slow circulation and a hypercoagulable state. I have not come across anyone with personally with fast atrial fibrillation that just suddenly will develop a, a PE as a result of, uh, of AFib or flutter without having a significant slow circulation or hypercoagulable state. Yes, AFib and flutter do cause hypercoagulability, um, but to have that degree, you know, of, um, of thrombus burden, um, one wonders whether there, you know, was an underlying hypercoagulable state recurrence. Unfortunately, things happen too fast for us to be able to confirm or refute that. But I, I do take that on board. Any other comments or questions? Hey, Nadia, this is Fatih. Can I chime in again? Absolutely, please do. Okay, can, can you go to the first uh, uh, PE case, uh, the first one? Um, the one before, yes, this one here. I, th I think this is a this EKG is very interesting and I think uh, uh, very educational for the same reasons Nadia mentioned and Asam mentioned earlier. Uh, uh, another comment here when you comment about the T wave inversion V1, V3, V4, and like you said, uh, lots of people will think about LAD disease and you know, coronary artery disease. Just to add to this, I have a quiet collection of this cut, same type EKG, uh, people with pulmonary and blastigitmus. To add to the confusion, most of these patients have abnormal troponin, and that will even lead them to the direction of uh, workup of uh, coronary artery disease. So they ended up in the cath lab or something like this. The elevated troponin, however, is, it's usually due to, or at least what we think is due to right ventricular strain pattern and that gives you elevated troponin that kind of confuses the picture. I think if you look here on the, is that like uh, Nadia um, uh, alluded to, the right axis deviation should be, should give you a pause, you see. And if you look, look at lead one, lead one, you see there's an S that's deep and uh, an AVL is, is negative. You see AVL is negative. So the axis is right. And the other thing in lead one, so the question, you, when, whenever you see a negative S in lead one, also look at the P wave. Is it upright or negative? The P wave here is upright. So this means whatever pathology here is not due to uh, the technical left arm, right arm switch, which can give you uh, uh, right, uh, normally uh, EKG look like this. And also is not due to dextrocardia. If you go to the case of dextrocardia, the P wave in the dextrocardia lead one should be negative, like in the case Nadia showed earlier, if you can show the EKG. So here, I think a combination of uh, right axis deviation, as you can see, 
Yeah, if you go to the dextrocardia case, look at the P wave there. You see the P wave is negative in lead one. You see that EKG? So, so that's something technical or dextrocardia, but the one uh, that EKG with when you see right axis, true right axis deviation with the P wave and change and the T wave inversion, plus you know the rest of the history, syncope, et cetera, even with the troponin is positive. I think pulmonary embolus should be your um, uh, very high on your differential diagnosis. So do D-dimer, uh, pulmonary CT, before you take the patient to the cath lab or think about that. The second case, if you go to the uh, second case, the AFLAR, AFib, yes, this one here. Now we don't have much of right axis deviation here. Probably the patient is older. They tend to have more left axis when they get older. But the, like an idea, if you have somebody with AFib and syncope, AFib rarely, rarely give you syncope. Uh, AFib by itself give you maybe hypotension, et cetera, but a drastic syncope like this, somebody has AFib, especially if this AFib is, is new. Uh, I don't know the exact the cause why PE causes atrial fibrillation. Do they exist? Or the mechanism, as I mentioned, uh, they coexist in some patient or whatever. But the bottom line is that AFib itself should not be, should not explain why this patient has syncope. So if you see that AFib and uh, fast um, rhythm like this, and there's no other reason to explain syncope, also think about pulmonary embolus. Although here you don't have much of clues, like the, the incomplete right bundle is very subtle, but you, sh you should think about it uh, as well. So this is another uh, great case for that. That's all the comment I have, uh, Ned. Thank you so much. That's fantastic. Very, very valuable gems as always. So now, okay. So we're going to get into the meat and potatoes now. 58-year-old female. So BIBA is a term that we use here, brought in by ambulance. Palpitations. So 58-year-old lady, uh, shortness of breath. And her observations are relatively stable. So hemodynamically stable, her blood pressure is uh, stable. Uh, we have uh, respiratory rate is high at 28 per minute. Uh, temperature is a little bit borderline 37.6. No past medical history. She was blue lighted because of this ECG. This is a worrisome ECG. Um, it is very fast. And um, it is narrow complex, very, very fast, but abnormal morphology QRS. So we have Q waves almost, V1 to V3 to V4, and the R wave starts to come up in V5. Um, we have a lot of sharp little things happening. The rate is 300 beats a minute, believe it or not, in this 58-year-old lady. So she is able to conduct her AV node is giving her conduction one-to-one. -one. So whatever is happening, it is going from the atria down the ventricles or around the AVA node, but it's very fast. So we go down the ALS pathway here or the ACLS pathway, meaning you have your acutely unwell patient. You have to make sure that you go through the life-threatening systems and make sure that they are um, adequate before you move on. So she is her airway is patent for A. She is breathing spontaneously. We have a respiratory rate of 28 per minute. Her circulation is severely tachycardiac, but she's not hypotensive. So we've gone through the ACLS pathway. Um, we have tried now to terminate this arrhythmia with non-pharmacological methods. So we've done Valsalva and we've done vagal maneuvers, including carotid sinus massage, and that has not terminated. So there, I have three questions. So when you're seeing something, you're formulating a plan in your head. So I have three questions here for you. Would you DC cardiovert this patient? One is yes, two is no. Would you give IV amiodarone or cordarone to this patient? One is yes, two is no. Would you refer for an EP study and ablation? One is yes and two is no. So think about this in the context of this clinical case. And I want to bring in my colleagues here um, to show what happens. So rhythm strip is on. It tells you that the heart rate is 300 beats a minute. It shows you the, these are rhythm strips. So we have two channel here and two channel here, but then we get fast paged because we're told 
please hurry, this patient is having runs of VT. And you can appreciate in the bottom strip down here um, that there is this broad stuff coming through. We have about eight beats, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven beats of broad complex, which I'm gonna magnify for you to have a look at. Um, so what is going through your mind here when you see that? So we have a patient, we've given adenosine and it did not terminate the tachycardia. So that bottom slip had adenosine. Um, if I go back, I will show you that the rate is slowed a little bit, it's 200. Not 300, but we're getting these broad, complex tachycardias. And when we do a 12 lead, we see this. So we have this, we have this, and we have this. And that is very different to that. So what do you think is going on? And in comparison to my, uh, in relation to the questions I've asked, with one being yes and two being no, what would you do next? Okay, so um, I do draw your attention to the ESC guidance um, for adenosine usage. We've uh, had this talked about in the past where adenosine is very short acting. Um, Half-life is about uh, 20 seconds or so. You can get various responses. You have to make sure that you've given it centrally uh, in, a, in a big cannula and you followed it by big flush so it acts very quickly. So you either, get, you, you either get no effect because it was inadequate delivery or you have high septal VT. We had something like this, gradual slowing and then re-acceleration. And then if it terminates, it means it's some type of nodal dependent tachycardia or a, a very few atrial tachycardias or some very few type of VTs can terminate. Um, and then you have persistent tachycardia. So um, I will bring this back for discussion because I think this warrants a discussion. So um, have we had any comments in the chat? Yeah. And uh, please, Dr. Raisam and, 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 and Dr. Fethi, um, Please chime in. So we had multiple options. Uh, at least the first responders uh, went with MU and then uh, cardioversion, direct current cardioversion. Mm -hmm. Next one is MU ablation, MU ablation, and fascicular VT. Someone asking what was the blood pressure, and I said the blood pressure was normal. I think 130s, 290s. Yeah. That's what I remember correctly. Yes, so it was 130 to 90, um, and, and, and I will um, here say that um, in the emergency department after the adenosine failed, they uh, did start uh, an IV amiodarone drip, the 300, uh, 300 milligram was given. Uh, the blood pressure subsequently with that small dose of amio, because as you know, amio is a negative ionotropic agent, so the blood pressure uh, dropped to about 100, but um, IV normal saline was given and the blood pressure went up again. So um, I, I would uh, value people's, uh, I, I want you to think about the whole, the, the whole case. The whole, it's not only ECGs, it's also about the patient. So what's your next steps? What would you do? So we have this very, very fast, very fast tachycardia in someone who's middle aged who is able, who has a healthy conduction system, is able to transmit one to one up to three hundred beats a minute. Um, she is not hemodynamically compromised. She's sitting. She is talking to you. But going back in the history, because the history is very essential, also. Um, she has had palpitations and breathlessness for about three to four weeks now. So if she's not hemodynamically compromised, um, there is a risk of cardioverting this person who probably has had an arrhythmia for about three to four weeks. And this arrhythmia, we haven't worked out quite what it is. Um, and what if it's atrial arrhythmia? So, so here we look at the top and we look at the bottom and here after the adenosine, there's a little bit of slowing and we can see kind of group beating. We see periods where it slows and then it goes fast again and it slows and goes fast again. And then here where it slows and goes fast again, we get this um, broad complex and common is common. So can you have dual tachycardia? You can, but common is common in this setting where you have a very fast arrhythmia, short, long cycles, your conduction system is becoming fatigued and you, with the short long cycles, 
we, we do know of an electrophysiological phenomenon called phase, th called phase three block related to um, the depolarization of the conduction system um, and, 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 and uh, the recovery. Um, and that is probably just a manifestation of aberrancy because of uh, either fatigue of the conduction system or phase three uh, uh, block. But uh, it's more likely to be that than to be VT happening in addition. So overall, it looks irregular. We do see some P waves. Um, the chances are that this is an atrial type of flutter. So something going very, very fast in the atrium, transmitting to the ventricle equally fast, and the AV conduction system is able to transmit that fast rate. Um, and uh, we see here the P waves are very, the P waves are on the T waves here, so they're very spiky, tinted. So, um, and this is her 12 lead, and that gives you a little bit more appreciation that it's likely that this is atrial, atrial flutter type, atrial fibrillation. And you can see the P waves here, very regular, the P waves. Um, and they are on top of the T waves causing um, spikiness. And to cut a long story short, we were able to slow her down with beta blockers, slow um, IV metoprolol given at slow intervals. And here we've managed to slow the heart rate down uh, significantly, uh, just uh, about 150 here. And her labs were taken obviously, and they come back. Now troponin is not useful here because with this rapid tachycardia, you will get a troponin leak due to the rate alone. But here, do not forget that arrhythmias particularly atrial fibrillation and atrial flutters can be associated with other conditions like thyroid disease. So her TSH was undetectable. We couldn't even measure it, it was so, so low. And, and, and the free T4 was about four or more than four times the, the upper limit of normal. So she was profoundly thyrotoxic. Um, her thyroid autoantibodies were strongly positive. She had a BMP of 8,500. So as I was saying, she had been in this arrhythmia for about three uh, to four weeks. It is important to appreciate that cardioverting someone who's in a thyroid storm is probably not going to do anything but accentuate things with the adrenaline surge, and they will be right back into the arrhythmia. So Making sure that the person is not septic is very important. So remember the temperature was 37.6. She was clinically well in herself. She did not appear to be septic. The CRP was very marginally elevated. The temperature was 37.6. So you have to be wary that, you know, to make sure that there is no sepsis driving this very, very fast arrhythmia. And um, we initiated treatment both for um, atrial fibrillation, including anticoagulation rate control. Uh, the LV, when we slowed down the heart rate and were able to scan her, we found that there was severe LV dysfunction because she had been in this arrhythmia. So it's a tachycardiomyopathy for, for, for at least three to four weeks, at least that we know of. That's the duration that she's had the symptoms for. She had been losing weight because of hyperthyroidism for a long uh, period of time, about six weeks. Um, and so anti-coagulation, uh, uh, rate control, anti-thyroid uh, treatment, carbamazole, um, uh, in order to slow her down, and anti-failure therapy in order to, for her ventricle to improve. And then once we have her eothyroid and had been anticoagulated for a sufficient amount of time, three weeks minimum, um, pre-cardioversion, I would actually give her longer because um, her ventricle was so poor. Um, and then we would aim to get her back into sinus rhythm when she is eothyroid. Um, and I would value uh, inputs and I'd welcome questions. Um, one simple comment. Um, in general, you know, most flutter waves are going to be 200 millisecond cycle length. So if the heart rate is 75, 150, 
or 300, we always look closely for flutter waves. That's just one simple way of thinking about it. And if the flutter is not, if it's slower, like 75 or 150 beats a minute, and it's unrecognized or thought to be a fib, especially if it's a variable block, given flight and knife can lead to a one-to-one -one connection. Always important for cardiologists to remember that. That's a very important comment. So uh, Dr. Assam is saying that if you are, are thinking that this is flutter or you don't know, but it could be flutter. So you have a heart rate that's going along the 150, um, 300 or so, and you think that this is um, AF, you're, but you're not sure, don't give a class 1C agent or sotalol, something that would slow the atrial refractoriness, and then you could trans, you could make someone who was going at a stable flutter uh, at 150 beats per minute, you slow um, the, uh, the uh, effective uh, refractory, the ERP, the effective refractory, am I saying this right? The effective refractory period. Um, and you you en enable the AV node to be able to conduct. So instead of it conducting at two to one with 150 beats per minute, you then slow things for it to be able to conduct um, by the time the next flutter wave comes around and then it starts conducting one to one. So essentially you make someone who was very stable into someone who is very unstable. So that's a very important point. Without an AV node blocking drug. So you want to put an AV node blocking drug in. Dr. Fethi? Yes, uh, thanks, Nadia. Gr again, great case. If you go to that Zoom thing, and like I said earlier, this is a beautiful case explaining why uh, a flutter with one-to-one -one conduction should be in your differential diagnosis of very fast, wide, curious complex tachycardia. This not all of those are VTs. Some of the cases you see only wide, curious complex, like that's the one uh, Dr. Nadia zoomed on. You don't, you don't, you're not lucky enough to see narrow ones. But if you see, but if you see uh, narrow ones and then wide ones like this, like Nadia said, uh, common thing are being common. Most likely. The wide beats are narrow, but now the infrahessian conduction system get tired, get fatigued, or uh, phase three block or whatever, and now cannot conduct narrow, and then you see it wide. So this should be kept in your differential diagnosis. Uh, uh, a flutter with one-to-one -one conduction and a barren conduction that can give you this uh, wide curious complex, like ugly looking uh, EKGs. Beautiful case, uh, Nadia, no, no more comment. I agree with Rassam as well. Thank you very much. One thing I'd like to add, if you don't mind, is that adenosine can put people into atrial fibrillation. So if you have a fast rhythm, um, it could be an atrial attack, but then you give adenosine, you could switch um, that into um, atrial fibrillation just by giving adenosine, which is not common, but it could happen. Yes, yes. Yeah, absolutely. but that's but that's usually a very, very good point, Isam. And that's usually a good news because atrial fibrillation is typically easier to conduct, easier to rate control compared to atrial flutter. Uh, exactly. And and that's that's actually a question I would like to the audience to think about it and then maybe communicate later on on why atrial flutter is harder to rate control compared to atrial fibrillation. So everybody should th think about it and then. We probably need to have a discussion about that at a later time, just not to consume the rest of the presentation. Great point. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Fantastic points. Very, very important. Um, so uh, this is an ECG, uh, important for all that are working in cardiology to be able to recognize, or people in the emergency department to be able to recognize. So we are used to looking at P waves and QRS complexes. But we also know that we can see artifact in ECGs sometimes, and those artifacts could be related to uh, muscle movements, so myopotentials, or they could be related to interference, electromagnetic interference, or they could be very sharp things like these, pacing spikes. Okay, so with this ECG, you should be able to make a diagnosis. And what I want you to appreciate is that on this side, the right side of the screen, 
we have this spike here. It captures the ventricle. So it gives an evoked response, which is ventricular, um, a QRS basically, and it gives you a left bundle morphology and it's uh, a superior axis. So this is in the RV apex or, or, or lower down in the RV and it is capturing the RV. So we see that. So that means this is a pacing spike. It's a very high frequency, high amplitude in this case. Um, so it's a pacing spike. But what I do want you to appreciate also is that there is another sharp frequency here. You see it in the QRS here, here, here. Every QRS, you see it. That is not part of the QRS. That is also a pacing spike. But if you see, so you see these two, these two. So you have a, a, a pacing spike here and a pacing spike here. So the only way that you could have these two pacing spikes is that you have a dual chamber, at least a dual chamber pacemaker. You have a, you have a, a pacing spike here, and then you have it's followed by another pacing spike here. And then if we measure, so this is just over uh, one, two, three, uh, it's about three, four, four squares, um, four squares. So it's, it's about 110 milliseconds. Um, and what I want you to appreciate, regardless of what's happening with this second spike, you have a first spike that's capturing the ventricle. You have a second spike here that's not capturing anything. And the reason it's not capturing anything is because it hits the ventricle when the ventricle is refractory. So if you remember the action potential of the myocardial cells that we studied, the action potential you get into phase, um, phase four, where you can no longer uh, accelerate, you can no longer um, cause an evoked response until the membrane depolarizes again. And so here, the duration is a hint of what this other spike is. We won't go in, it's, it's beyond the scope of this presentation, um, but it's called ventricular safety pacing. And uh, this needs to make you think that, well, if this spike is in the ventricle, so where is this spike? So this is probably the atrial lead had displaced into the ventricular lead. It's capturing the ventricle. Um, and this is the ventricular lead, and this is the atrial lead on the x-ray. So the pacemaker, the leads, the atrial lead, it's an active fixation lead with a little screw. It has displaced it in the ventricular lead. So this is attached to the atrial port, so it's stimulating the heart first. And this one is the one that's giving out the ventricular safety pacing. And it's important to recognize that because a free atrial lead, even though it's sitting in the ventricle, it can move around and it can cause arrhythmia and it can be life-threatening. So you need to reposition that atrial lead. Okay, any questions or comments about this? Should we, yeah. Should it be the last case in this one? No, an hour and a half. Okay, um, should I, can I just show, what, what do you guys think? Should I uh, finish here or show this last case? Okay, uh, go ahead, Dr. Dr. Nadia, we can show that it would be the last one, yes. Go ahead, you can, you can, you can finish. Or should I, should I please. show? Yeah, please show it, Nadia, it's a nice case. The, this uh, EP case, this one? The... Yeah, this one, this one. Okay, so uh, so I'll show this case. Um, so this is just to show people what EP involves. Um, it, it's uh, or mapping what mapping involves in the cath lab. So this is a 34 year old lady with palpitations and near syncope. Um, her background is mild asthma that is well controlled. Very rarely needs to use her inhalers. There is no family history, and this is her ECG. And her ECG, um, when we scrutinize all the beats, we have a look here and we see that the, the, the PR interval is a little bit short, a little bit short. And even on measurement, the PR interval is 113 milliseconds. So it's on the shorter side. Um, so we screen her with a halter and throughout the whole of the 24 hours, she's doing this. The whole 24 hours is repeated broad complex beats that are coming in. And um, it, it comes into our differential. So we have sinus rhythm, and then we have these broad complex beats, broad complex beats. And here one wonders, is there a pseudo delta? Is, there, is this a P wave on a T wave, a pseudo delta, or is it just the timing of the capture of this ventricular? Uh, so 
the differential diagnosis of a broad complex tachycardia with like a pseudo delta, is it VT or ventricular? Or is it pre-excited AVRT? And so if we magnify this up and see it here, I wonder whether there's a P wave here and is it terminating with a P wave here? Uh, and, and this is the sinus P wave. So it might be just artifact here, but we see it here and we see it here. And then we have a sinus P wave. So with the differential diagnosis, um, we went on and gave adenosine, similar to what we did earlier, to see if there is manifest pre-excitation, if there's a pathway that's there, but we just can't see it properly. And we see here that there is sinus rhythm, and then you have slowing of the sinus uh, rate, but also you have complete AV block for these four beats. So there's no, you've blocked the AV node, and there's no other uh, site for this uh, arrhythmia to go, so there's no other accessory pathway. So it is um, uh, uh, not an accessory pathway. So we can kind of conclude that. And we put, the, uh, we put her on the treadmill and just into stage one, we start to see this. So as adrenaline is pumping, we start to see this uh, repeatedly happening. And um, I'll draw your attention that it has a left bundle morphology with uh, an inferior axis. So it's a left bundle inferior axis with a transition at V3. You do need to be careful with um, uh, the exercise tolerance ECGs because the leads sometimes can be a little bit not in the exact position because of, of uh, people are exercising, you wanna have them in a stable position. But nonetheless, this tells us that um, it is a VT that's coming from high up high up in the uh, ventricles. And we know that the echo is normal and the CMR is normal. There is no scar. So this is a normal heart VT, which could be coming from the right ventricular outflow tract. It's not particularly wide. So the QRSs are wide. Yes, there are more than 120 milliseconds, but not, they're not massively wide. And when we look at the uh, inferior axis, they're not notched. Um, so one wonders whether this is septal RVOT. Another place it could be coming from is the LV summit. So this is an important person to take to the cath lab because she's having rims and rims and it's a class one indication um, to e either ablate or treat with drugs. We did treat with drugs. She kept having them despite beta blockers and despite flecainide combination. So um, in the cath lab, um, we have multiple screens. Some people have one huge screen now, which is divided into four or five uh, parts where we see x-ray and traces. And here are catheters for a conventional EP study placed either in the right atrium, um, in the coronary sinus, in the right ventricle, or at the His bundle. The coronary sinus will tell you what's happening in the right atrium and the left atrium. And we look at intracardiacs. And we're not going to discuss what the intracardiacs here show, but essentially we're looking at the atrial activation versus the ventricular activation and the surface ECG is here. And here we're looking at it at 100 millimeters per second. So very, very, very fast uh, compared to the previous 50 and 25 that we talked about. And for this type of patient, we uh, map with a 3D mapping system. So we create an endocardial shell of the chamber that we go into. And this system is called an insight system. And we map to see, is there scar in the, um, in the ventricle or substrate or, or other areas that can uh, explain why she has this? So we substrate map, looking at the voltages. And here, purple means it's all healthy tissue. So the voltages are above one and a half millivolts. This endocardial geometry is created by moving a catheter in the right ventricle, and we point, we put in points and mark important areas. So we mark the His bundle because we don't want to uh, to damage it. We mark the right bundle potential, um, and then here, this little tail is the coronary sinus. So this is giving us an anatomical shell. And the torso is at the top here, so you can appreciate how uh, the, the, the x-ray or the image is taken from. So is it taken from a lateral? Is it taken uh, from an LAO? So um, 
we look here and we do activation mapping. So on the right hand of the screen here, we have the 12 lead ECG on the top and Marta Jidden here because it's 200 millimeters per second. Then we have the coronary sinus, the right ventricle, and then we have the ablation catheter. And here we're looking at the site of where this focus is coming from. And we get earlier than the exit point on the surface QRS and that points it here to the posterior septum of the right ventricular outflow tract. And then we come to this spot. So here we're, we're very early, we're 40 milliseconds, and we come to this spot and we pace from here. So we want to see, can we mimic the ectopic beat or the VT that's happening? And when we pace from here, we get a 99% match. And I wish I could say that all cases are like this. No, they are not. Um, and that's why I'm presenting it. Um, we don't always get a 99% match, but here we did. And when we come on with a cautery or ablation, we get a little run of ventricular arrhythmias and within 30 seconds, everything is quiet. Uh, so after 30 seconds, there is no more focus and we give two consolidating lesions. So those are the two lesion, the three lesions that have been delivered. And here, I wanted to show you that the colors here for activation, the red and the, the white means the earliest, the red is um, second earliest and the purple is latest. So we can see that we're very late in the coronary sinus and we're earlier and earlier and earlier as we get to the septum of the outflow tract. So with this, I wanted to conclude, um, unless people have um, questions or comments, I do wanna say that the RVOTVT in normal hearts generally is a benign condition. Class one indication for treatment is either ablation or drugs. Um, have there been reported cases of outflow tract tachycardias in a normal heart that do cause um, cardiac arrest. There are a few reported cases, and we reported this back in 2016. So if you want to have a look at that case report. Um, but with that, I will uh, conclude. Unless um, people have any questions or comments, please uh, do. And I will go to my conclusions. And we can do a, a second part, if you guys wish, in the near future. Yeah, certainly. خلينا نسمع من الدكتور عصام بريون لو عندك final comments دكتور عصام. Yes, مرحبا uh, uh, Excellent presentation. I learned a lot from this. Uh, I want to make a quick comment on adenosine, just so I can summarize. Um, I mean, adenosine terminates uh, re-entry SVT, 20% of atrial tax, and then some VT, like Dr. Nadia mentioned, the fascicular VT and the cyclic uh, AMP mediated VTs, but um, it's not always going to be helpful to differentiate uh, every SVT from VT. Most of the time it's given from a peripheral uh, cannula and does not reach the heart on time. Most time it's given in small doses by some ERs. So central line, higher doses, you'll see better effect in general. Of course, like I said, it causes uh, negative uh, dromotropy, AV block, and also negative chronotropy. So you see a slowing in sinus node and it causes vasodilatation. In general then, how can I summarize when to use adenosine in wide complex tachycardia? I always try to remind myself it has to be regular, stable patient. You know, if the patient's unstable, there's no time to play. Monomorphic, wide complex tachycardia. So regular, stable, monomorphic white complex. If it's irregular white complex, you worry about AFib and pre-excitation and you can worsen the situation into FEF. So that is in general my take on the uh, uh, denizine. Doctor, Doctor. Fantastic, thank you so much. Dr. Fethi Dries, your final comments. Thanks so much, uh, everybody. Thank you, Mansoor, Isam, Nadia, as usual. Awesome, outstanding uh, presentation. I definitely learned. And please uh, present the rest of the slides. I know the rest of the slides are even more interesting. So I think we need a session number two for Dr. Nadia to educate us about the rest of that. The only, the, just to, to add to whatever Isam said about that, Denison, I think Dr. Nadia today showed something unique that uh, people need to think about it every now and then which is we usually give adenosine in patients who have tachycardia, 
But today she showed us a couple of examples where when you suspect an accessory pathway and you're not sure, you wanna rule it in or rule it out, you can give adenosine and sinus rhythm. And that can have major, major implications on the management of these patients. Uh, it's usually need somebody who's comfortable with giving adenosine and know that you may have heart block for about five, six, eight, ten 10 beats, whatever you may have pause. You need to tell the patient, uh, you're gonna feel hot, you're gonna feel a little bit weird for a few seconds and then it's gonna go away. Do it in the intensive care unit if you can, or in a place where you have good IV, uh, the patient is flat, completely flat, the patient is on a monitor, you have the rhythm strip running on the EKG machine so you can document whatever you do, otherwise you wasted the whole uh, opportunity of documenting this. Uh, be comfortable, be, be ready, rarely, rarely, people may go to some ventricular arrhythmias or atrial fibrillation, like as some said with adenosine, so just be ready for that. Ideally, you have the, uh, the paddles of the, car, uh, the defibrillator paddles anterior, posterior, ready to go just in case. But it's it's a it's a it's a smart test to do if you suspect an accessory pathway and you're stuck, you don't know to give it, not to give it, where the patient has accessory pathway, should I refer to EP or not? It, it's a simple test, but it can detect life-threatening conditions. So Nadia today showed us a couple of examples of this, and I have a few of my collections we'll probably share at some point, but this is a very smart, uh, smart test. Otherwise, uh, outstanding presentation, Nadia, and thank you so much and uh, everybody. Thank you all for your, for, um, your comments and your contribution. It was exceptionally valuable as always. Um, I wanna conclude by saying, ensure the ECG is validated. Know what you're looking at. Scrutinize every beat because you could have intermittent pre-excitation and if you don't look at it, you're not gonna see it. Uh, ECGs do not lie. If recorded properly, what you see is what you get. Do not use single rhythm strips to make a diagnosis. Not all VTs are broad, some SVTs are broad. So the broadness of the QRS doesn't necessarily tell you the mechanism. Beware of artifacts, myopotentials, pacing spikes, electromechanical interference. Chamber activation timing and morphology are essential. You need to know what your P to QRS relationship or no relationship is. Interpret the ECG in the clinical context of the patient. Remember that provocation techniques, be that Valsalva, carotid sinus massage, or adenosine, et cetera, are useful diagnostic tools if you use them effectively. And try to tie the findings together to formulate a diagnosis of underlying disease process or etiology. And I thank you all for your attention and I thank you for the invitation to precipitate and uh, best wishes for ongoing success. Shukran, uh, shukran, Dr. Nadia. I always say at least my personal uh, perspective, AKG is the most important test in cardiology and maybe the hardest uh, to learn and interpret and hopefully by this lecture series from uh, the Libyan Cardiac Society and uh, we have a group of genius electrophysiologists here to help us to unfold this mystery. So we'll continue forward hopefully every two months with the ACZ lecture, lecture series. مرة أخرى شكرا دكتور نادية كانت محاضرة قيمة جدا شكرا دكتور عصام بريون دكتور فتحي دريس شكرا لجميع الحضور اليوم وحنستمر إن شاء الله بالإيكو as well as ACZ lecture series. والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله. عليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته شكرا جزيلا مع السلامة.